if you can always get your properties to buy your properties, that is how you play the game without money sustainably. All right. Good morning, everyone. We have a small group for this, which is totally fine. We'll get a lot, actually quite a few more people throughout the day. Um, however, as we fill up, we're going to get rolling. I always start these a little bit late because uh, this is how they always start, so this is just fine. But uh, for those who don't know, I'm Christian. Cody was going to be here, but his girlfriend had uh, knee surgery, so he'll be zooming in for his panel uh, with the best investor I've ever met, uh, Matt Hawkins. So that's going to be a really fun panel we're going to have immediately after lunch. I am working with Cody to also try to get some Q&A time with him uh, via Zoom. So we're going to try to get two sessions with Cody. So if anyone has Cody questions, uh, we will bring him in virtually. Last night, we figured out how to get him on this little screen. While it's a small screen, we'll still have the ball in and rolling. I'm going to give you guys all a little bit of backstory. And then uh, on the Robin Hood, this event, and uh, just us in general. And then we're going to get going from there. So, again, uh, I'm Christian. I started investing in 2016. My wife and I bought a condo. It was just a livid flip. So, we did the uh, two bed. Good morning. Good morning. We did the uh, uh, two bed, two bath. We had a roommate. We did all the renovations ourselves, so laid the floors, redid the lights, uh, did plumbing. Unfortunately, the building, uh, <clears throat> you'd have to shut off the water for the whole building to actually do any of the plumbing. So I did all the plumbing with the water still on. Uh, do not recommend. Uh, however, we pulled it off. If you've ever tried to change a shower valve while the water's coming out, um, you need to be really fast and have a really good mallet to get it in there before the water pushes it back out. Uh, but that's how I learned to start investing. I did everything myself on a small project. And that small project was just enough to eventually sell and buy a larger house. From there, that was 2016 through 2018. Uh, from there, I still wanted to be an investor. I started working at the CoStar Group, uh, Apartments.com, LoopNet. And I had this belief. <clears throat> and I think it comes from school where you go from first grade, second grade, third grade to get a job, to, or to go to college, get a job, to you know, the general... Uh, American dream, uh, but I went, okay, i got to qualify myself to be a bigger investor. So I worked at the CoStar Group, uh, worked with all sorts of developers, bankers, property managers, and uh, I spent two years not buying any real estate, being in real estate. Uh, it took uh, the whole world shutting down in 2020, where they said, hey, you're an outside sales rep, uh, we're going to just shut down, you're going to be inside for the next year, maybe two. I was like, well, that doesn't sound fun. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do something else. Um, I've always wanted to be an investor. Uh, that's how I learned a very simple truth. Uh, the only way to become an investor is to, in fact, invest in a property. Uh, that is the sole way to be a real estate investor. I started with a duplex, then we bought another duplex, and that's about as far as my money carried me. I'm like, okay, I've got two duplexes. They're paying the mortgage on my house. This is pretty cool. Um, I don't think I want to do another eight-year career thing to buy another four units. This is taking a little bit longer than I wanted to. How do we scale up? Around that time, I was working in an office, uh, actually on a, a call center project. Uh, we were collecting data, and I was working through a brokerage that Cody happened to be working at. Now, Cody was, uh, well, actually, at the time, he, had just, uh, he was just about to turn 21 uh, when I first ran into him. He had a 12-plex. The second time I saw him when I started working for this firm, he already had another 12-plex. So he's 21. Uh, he had 24 units. I was like, how did this kid do that? Because I know for a fact, he has not sold a single property as a broker. Uh, in fact, his, his boss was like, I was going to fire him, but I figured he'd quit, and he just never stopped showing up. So Cody just went after this uh, this real estate agent thing hard for years. Uh, I think it was about two years, <laughs> he was really trying to get it going, and ended up finding a way to buy the real estate. Uh, so he bought 24 units. He got a, a unit right across from my duplex, this uh, sixplex in Moses Lake, Washington. And so I was like, okay, he's 21. He has 30 units. How is he doing that? Because I like the idea of scaling a lot faster without having to add all the steps. And that's where Cody really came and said, hey, I've been working with a couple of people learning creative finance. This is what I have put together. He said, hey, I want to get 30 units too. He's like, I can't help you. I'm sorry. I want to buy a 38 plex. I need a partner on this. And uh, that'll put you 42. And that's how we got started. Bought the 38 plex, bought for $2 million, seller financed, 15% down. Uh, we raised the 15%. We had never raised money before. I had absolutely no idea how that worked. And that is where we came up with deal and debt and equity. Um, you have a good opportunity 
that you can communicate, uh, you can buy anything. Now, there's an argument to be made that we learned you can buy anything. We bought everything. You probably don't need to scale as fast as we did, but over the next couple of years, uh, we picked up about 200 multifamily units. We have the resort here, uh, started a couple of companies, and the rest is history. But that is us in a nutshell of what we have done. The focus for today, we're going to talk a little bit about acquisition, and there's a lot of Q&A. So I know a lot of people who are on the starting part of your career are going to have some questions around, like, okay, how, how do you get to the buy part? However, we focused on that on our last four events very heavily. All the money, basically all the money, is made in how you run the project, the actual asset manage, and then how you do the value add. Uh, we want to spend some time today talking about how you actually factor for your value add projects. We talk a lot about, hey, if you're trying to build equity in real estate, say you're trying to set up your first $10,000 of passive income. I know some of you guys are way beyond that, some of you guys are starting from zero, but the simple math is if you have $2 million of equity earning 6%, that's $120 a year, that's your $10,000 a month. Now, if you're starting from zero, how do you get that $2 million? The easiest way to do that, or at least the simplest, is you're going to be doing some value add projects. You're going to be buying a piece of real estate at a price where it cash flows day one, and you're going to build equity over time by either increasing rents, doing improvements on the property. All those things cost money. So we're going to talk about how you buy creatively. But we're really going to focus a lot on what does the actual math look like for, okay, um, I, I'm starting with, you can start with money, you can start with no money, but how do I make my money go as far as it can by the way I buy my deal? Do I raise capital up front? Do we cash flow through it? Those are all questions we're going to answer with deals that we've done. Little history on the space. This is Robin Hood Village Resort. This was built in 1934. So we are on year 90 of uh, running this place. Still a lot of projects that we would like to do, uh, but this is the one of the three original buildings. So uh, this used to be the restaurant. Uh, the Nordstrom family, like Nordstrom's, Nordstrom's uh, owned this for a majority of his life. Uh, they ran a, it was like a really cool restaurant. They served like elk and buffalo and all sorts of like cool meats. Um, it lost money every year of his operations. Apparently it, it was a negative couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, but they loved it, and so they just kept it going. Uh, when it sold, uh, the owners ran for a few years. I, mean, I don't like losing money, and so they shut this down. Uh, the other side of the building, where a lot of us met this morning, uh, was the old bar. So the, the pub is somewhere where we've had a ton of music and concerts go, go through. Um, the Union is actually a music town. Population of about 1,000. ton of just world-class musicians in they were really bummed when the pub got shut down. And that shut down in 2020. And the prior owners converted this into a, uh, legally into a triplex. So it was downgraded from commercial restaurant to triplex. So we can't do as many cool things like serve alcohol and serve food here. What we ended up doing was we host events like this. Uh, we still do a lot of weddings through here. And uh, we are bringing music back to the Robin Hood, which has been one of our biggest projects here. So we have concerts in the summer that are about 250 people. We fill everything here, food trucks, vendors. Uh, we had Sugarland play for us as our opener, which was very fun. And um, then we just absolutely packed the pub, probably beyond the capacity that uh, we really should. And uh, just have a huge party in there afterwards. So that is this project. This is a really cool piece of real estate. Uh, We'll actually talk a lot more about should we have bought this or not. But this is a really cool piece of real estate, an awesome piece of history. And I think it's a great example of you really can figure out how to buy anything. Managing it is a whole different animal. There's a lot of hospitality, but we'll get into that as we go. So everyone, welcome to the Robin Hood. Welcome to the event. Good morning, and we're going to get rolling. So topic number one is the real estate math. I figured let's start with math because everyone's tired and uh, this is going to wake us up a little bit. There's not a lot of complicated math with real estate, but I just want to talk about what it actually looks like when you're doing a value add project versus any other acquisition. So when we're buying anything, we have a few principles. It's, it's how do we buy it, how do we never lose it? you got to answer those two questions every single time. First mentor we ever had was the best single buyer of real estate I've ever seen. Uh, back before, right before 2008, he bought a ton of condos, zero down, loaded up on them, lost them all. Uh, 2008 ha happened, uh, he had short-term debt on all of them, 
<clears throat> whole portfolio collapsed. He was able to wiggle his way around declaring bankruptcy, but he did lose every single property, which is a bummer. So he restarted with his knowledge of, hey, I know how to buy anything. He bought a amazing office building, uh, downtown Tacoma, which is just down the way here, for a million dollars, which is a fantastic price point for this thing. It's a huge historic mansion. He put his brokerage in there. Sincerely, a very good buy. His next acquisition was the office down the street. It was worth probably about a million and a half, maybe a million. Uh, he bought it for $3 million, uh, seller financed on a short-term note, and then uh, mm -hmm. raised all the down payment for it. Having the belief that, hey, I can use this co-working space, and we can quadruple the rent of every space around us. For context, his projections for how his rent was going to go up per square foot was about $5 per square foot more than Amazon's new tower. Um, this is an old historic building that needed a lot of renovation. The numbers were never going to work on that. And lo and behold, uh, there was no plan to not lose it. The plan was, oh, we'll make enough money in all the businesses. And even if it goes wrong, we'll, everything will work. That is how we came up with our basic underwriting criteria. That is the thing. How do you buy it? How do you never lose it? We watched someone who can buy everything and could not figure out how to keep it. And we were sitting in the office, and that was the basic conversation of, what if we could do everything this guy could do, but then not lose the real estate? I think that means we're rich. <laughs> Let's try doing that. Uh, so that is what we did. We came out and said, okay, what are the things that cause deals to fail? And the first one was short-term debt. That's what killed Dave Ramsey's business. That's what killed, I mean, really, that's what ended up getting the, the guy who taught us how to play the game is he kept doing short-term loans, one-year debt, three-year debt, on projects that really should be five- to ten-year projects. So we started going along. It's like, okay, uh, the term matters, especially if you're doing creative finance. You get to choose your own interest rate. You get to choose the terms. So if you're coming in to any deal and you get to negotiate your own debt product, put as simply as possible, an asset makes you money every month, a liability loses money every month. You're setting, this is my expense, this is the income I'm buying. If that is short term, whatever you negotiated there is only good as long as you've negotiated for it. Long term is everything. We want to lock that in, we want to give ourselves time, we don't want anything to change, which goes to number two, fixed rate. If you're negotiating your own interest rate, the funny thing is Cody and I were talking about this right before interest rates quadrupled, so we looked like geniuses, but I mean, it's just kind of like basic math. Like, if we're setting our liability and locking in our expenses, we don't want them to magically change. Especially when we were buying, interest rates were at like 3%. I'm like, okay. Well, and of course, we're doing self-finance to like 5 and 6%, so that we didn't really care. But I'm like, if these change, we lost all the value that we negotiated on the contract. So variable rate debt needs to be out. That pretty much covers you. You buy it where it cash flows on long-term fixed rate debt. And now you can buy any building. And every time you close, your income goes up. You can stack this again and again and again. And we have a few stages where you buy, you stabilize, you optimize. And then we are fans of paying off all the debt. That seems to be what the masters of the game do. You can only do that if you hold the building long term. So everything that we do is, hey, and it's still fine to sell buildings. But you don't want to have to sell. So when we go through, buy, stabilize, optimize, hold the building. Your rents will continually go up over time as we print more and more money. But if you fixed your expenses, you just do better and better and better every year. You know, barring anything terrible happening, which sometimes does happen in real estate, we'll also get into that. I had a building flood last night. So there's all sorts of fun things that happen in real estate. But how do we factor for them? So value add math. When we have a project where we are doing value add, there's a few questions, especially if you've spent all of your capital or Say you have a few hundred thousand dollars, but you find a project where it's like, hey, this is millions. Like if, if you don't have all the money for your project, how do you factor for what it's going to cost, the time it's going to take, uh, the refinance? We have a lot of people who've gone through, and Cody and I have done this to a certain extent. We're a building. We're like, hey, uh, the cash flows pretty well. We're going to do these projects over time. So we'll take the rents and we'll renovate a unit. We'll get someone in there. We'll renovate a unit. We'll get someone in there. And so we're going to just focus on raising the money we need to close a great deal. We found the problem with that is vacancy is really expensive. And sometimes unit turns get more expensive than you think. 
Uh, but really what you want to be able to do on any project is you want to quickly get to the stabilization as fast as humanly possible. If I buy a building, uh, say, like a 38 is actually a great example. Uh, 38 units, and you have 10 vacancies, and I think we have five non-pays. So there's like 15 problems with income. Non-pays are pretty easy. We worked with them. We got all of them on government assistance programs, so that got pretty much fixed. The 10 vacancies, we were fixing them one at a time, so income was going up like this. The lost potential revenue was like ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month that we could have just been bringing in, speeding through our other projects. So the first thing you want to do, if you can, you want to work on the capital raise. If you can bring in the money and you're able to sustain it, bring in the money you need to do your project up front. You want to hammer through these as fast as humanly possible. So if you're raising for a deal, uh, say like 38, you're buying for 2 million. What we did, I think I have pens here somewhere, I do. So we have a, this is how we structured it. I'll share how we should have structured it. So we bought for 2 million. $2 million, uh, we put 300 down, and we raised the 300,000. We offered everyone a two to one in five years on the debt. So we basically said, hey, uh, this is a great deal. It has a ton of upside. We need to preserve cash flow. So in lieu of distributing rents, we're going to have a buyout clause that says, raising 300 in five years, we'll pay you guys all 600,000. And that'll be the deal. So we closed the deal and we said, okay, well now we have to get incomes up or we have to earn new money to renovate all these units. We have 15 units to renovate. So 15 units to rent out. What we should have done, instead of trying to fix the rents and bleed this along and make it a two year project to get the building fully stabilized, we just finished renting this thing out uh, about a month ago. So we've owned it for two years. We've still refinanced it twice. I mean, we've, we've got the incomes up from $5,000 a month to $20,000 a month. Now we're sitting at about $28,000 a month. Uh, with the target, we're getting 30 here pretty soon. If we had just came in and raised an additional $300,000, we raised six, we could have just renovated all the units and then filled the building. And that income, could have cash flowed the siding project, the window project. You want to work on the habitability piece first. There's all sorts of stuff you can do on the exterior. There's replacing windows, upgrade a septic field, whatever your project is. Rule number one is you need to keep the building full. Vacancy sucks. For lack of a better word, vacancy is just awful. You can bring people in even at lower rents while you're going to be doing more projects. What do we need to do to make this a nice place to live? A lot of people, especially developers, are going to push, hey, the bank is going to have more value on the exterior. If it looks better, it's worth more. And so a lot of people come in and they work on the exterior first. We do the exact opposite. We come in and we go, okay, um, interiors, is this someone, someone, somewhere where someone wants to live? Are the carpets good? Do we need to switch or can we switch to LVP floors? I mean, for entry-level housing, they don't need to be fancy. They need to look nicer. Um, are the cabinets all banged up? Let's rip those off. Um, are the countertops banged up? Same thing. Appliances, do they look nice or is the fridge covered in rust? A lot of people will come in and they'll do new siding, new windows, they'll repair the roof, and they'll go ahead and refinance it. I think I'll, I'll bank on getting my money there. The bank wants to see, above all things, stable, consistent income in which you are paying your debt. They care about one metric more than any, which is my favorite metric. D S C R debt service coverage ratio. The reason that they care about it, the reason that we love it, this is how much money you have after all expenses. Uh, you'll have see terms in real estate like NOI, your net operating income, uh, the cap rate on the deal. There's a place for all of these, but debt service coverage ratio is awesome because NOI is your operating. It does not include your debt product. Debt service coverage ratio is all of your expenses. After all of your incomes are in and all of your expenses are in, how much money is left to pay your mortgage and to pay yourself? And so this is a ratio that basically says if you bought at a one, so debt service coverage ratio of one, 
you can cover all of your expenses with your operating income and exactly pay your mortgage with no margin whatsoever. We like to target a 1.5, which means no matter what we buy, after we pay everything, we pay our mortgage and 50% of whatever we pay for our mortgage is what we get to pay ourselves. That is stable. Most banks will lend on a 1.25, maybe as low as a 1.2. Um, but that gives you a great margin and consistent cash flow. You've factored for all your expenses. We're targeting getting right here. This is much easier when you have a full building. So that is what we try to focus on. Had we done that, here's how we would have saved money by doing the cash flow model. So back to our 300,000. We bought 50% down, we raised the down payment, we had to do the rest on earned income and cash flow. Uh, we ended up selling a little easement to the city, which got us started. We got $30,000 in right off the bat, rented a couple of units. We're like, okay, we're starting to roll one project at a time. Uh, really slow. What we ended up doing once we got all the rents up is we did our first refi. We got that done 11 months in and we pulled $300,000 out of that. And it was a long process and it was a pain. Uh, we almost got it done at 4.5% interest. We passed underwriting and the day of signing, the bank just didn't send the docs to sign. And we called and we called and two days later, like, hey, uh, you passed underwriting, but the VP took a uh, look at your portfolio. We just weren't comfortable that you don't have any bank loans yet. I'm like, well, how do I get a bank loan if no one gives me a bank loan? Like, that doesn't even make sense. Your underwriters loved it. The deal makes sense. They're like, yeah, we're just not, we're not as comfortable. There's too many seller finance notes. We just, we want to see someone else take the leap first. So instead of 4%, we ended up with 6% money. And instead of interest only, we ended up with amortized. So end of the day, we would have, if we could have just locked in our first one, we would have had like $7,000 a month payments. Instead, we have $13,000 a month payments. I was like, that is a bummer. I mean, some of it's going towards principal, but like, shoot. When you're trying to rent out of cash flow and you just lost $5,000 on your first project, that is not fun. We wouldn't have had to do the first refi if we raised the money up front. And so what we did is we took that money and we reinvested it back into the property. So we fixed more units. That is where we did the residing project. We replaced windows that needed to be replaced and we actually got the campus mostly done. Uh, that's refi number one. Well, now you're at the end of that money. We want to cycle more money into the building and we want to buy out investors and you want to go through all the different pieces. Uh, we did a second refi. Which was pretty similar terms, but you have a bunch of closing costs, you have expensive fees, you spend a bunch of money and time going through these arduous refis. Instead of having to like, get the value up, expensive refinance, pull the money out, get the value up again, expensive money, refi out. The problem with that, if you remember the start of this, we talked about sustainability. How do you buy on long-term fixed rate debt? If you have to keep changing your debt product to pull money out, you have to roll the debt dice again. Where's the market at? That's the money I can get. If you raise up front and you fix your variables up front where they work, you don't have to do that to get through your projects. I'm not saying refinance is never the way to pull new capital, but that shouldn't be your first and best option. Uh, so when you're doing the math, there's two pieces of math you need to do. Up front, day one, does it fit the metrics? Can we cash flow on long-term cash flow and fixed rate debt? Um, and we'll... Uh, at the end of this, I'll email out the basic calculator we use. I mean, most of you guys have them, but um, I will send out. Like, this is how we calculate it. As simply as humanly possible, this is what we use. But at the end of the day, can you lock that in? The next thing you need to do for math on every single project is, what's it going to cost me if we get to point A to point B? And we're going to do the exact same math on the exact same calculator, whatever calculator you want to use. On At the end of my debt, whether we're selling the building or not, we're exiting the debt product. So at the end of the project is the end of your debt. At the end of the debt, what is the math going to look like very conservatively? We're going to run the numbers again, just like we did the first time. Conservatively, what do we think rents are going to be like if rents don't go up? Say we have five-year debt. Uh, rents will go up over five years. There's almost, I, I can't think of a single five-year period in history where rents didn't go up. However, let's say rents don't go up in the next five years. We just get to market rent today. Does the deal work? If uh, you know if our projects go well and we can get let's not factor for 100% occupancy, but let's say we can get to 90 95% occupancy, 
Does it work with that amount of vacancy? Can I still refinance? Say you had to bring in a bunch of money for your project. At the refinance, can I pull enough money at 70% loan to value of the new value to pay out my investors? The goal on every project, every time is, will the real estate buy the real estate? If you can always get your properties to buy your properties, that is how you play the game without money sustainably. Now, when we have money, which sometimes when you get in real estate, that's one of the nice, nice things about it, you, you have cash flow. You may sell a building that doesn't fit in your portfolio or you get a high equity position in, but you do get little hits of cash in here. Just because you can play without money doesn't mean you don't use your money and invest in real estate. I mean, have your money go to work for you. That's money you don't have to raise. But when you're playing this game, the simplest thing is, can I do basic math to get to my property is buying my property every single time. Real estate buys the real estate. Real estate buys the real estate. And it gets easier the more pieces you get on the board. So that's the main thing that we wanted to cover here because this is something that Cody and I just messed up on so many deals when we got started because we didn't have, we didn't have anyone teaching us this stuff. Uh, we went like, okay, well, we can buy the deal for nothing and then we can figure out a way to sustain it. But there were no efficiencies. When do we raise capital up front? How much can we do? All it came down to was you do the same math twice. What does it look like day one? Does it fit our principles that we have for investing? What does it look like at the end of the debt, the exit of whatever we have originally negotiated? What do we think it's going to look like conservatively if the market, you just don't want to be like, oh, well, if the interest rate double, uh, what happens to my deal? Can I get the financing? For a lot of people, the answer is no. People have balloons coming up. A lot of people losing real estate right now, uh, especially in the syndication space where they tend to do deals with low margin. You're seeing a lot of deals, properties just go back to the lender. A lot of people are either hurting or going under and have to write not fun emails to their investors. Whereas, because Cody and I did focus well on the long term fixed rate thing, we don't have any changes in our portfolio right now. That's the, if there's anything we did right in our investing. Interest rates went up. People were like, dude, you guys are dumb. You're borrowing at 5 6%. We're borrowing at 3 I'm like, yeah, but it's locked in and it cash flows. Well, now people are borrowing at 8 And I'm like, yeah, my 5% feels pretty good. It doesn't change for another 15 years. Like, this is great. <laughs> set, the, set your deals in a way where they're going to be sustainable. That is the main question you need to ask yourself every time. How is this going to be sustainable? Uh, I have two questions. Yeah. So about the buyout, that's... What you guys offered was a guaranteed buyout of two to one. So that uh, that three hundred, you're going to pay them six hundred within five years. Is that right? Yes. Well, one one thing that's important legally, you can't guarantee. It, it's, it's not a guaranteed buyout. You can't be. Don't word it that way because you actually can get in trouble. Um, you have a buyout option, and you can set penalties for not buying them out, but you actually can't guarantee a buyout option. Just fun fact. Uh, my, my lawyer was like, uh, "Yeah, okay. my lawyer was like, don't say that." <laughs> but um, like uh, for for uh, a great deal, uh, Pheasant Street, there's three side by side duplexes. Uh, that was also done uh, two to one in five years. It's a, it's a good, easy metric. Uh, that was actually that person's goal. They're like, "Hey, I would like to double my money in like every five years in real estate." And he'd done some uh, flip projects. He's like. I made money and then I lost it on the next project. I made money, I lost it on the next project. Like, all I want to do is just like place money in real estate and if it doubles every five years, I'm happy. I was like, okay, so I have a deal, uh, 10% down, 900,000. If you bring in 90, we can pay you 180 out of the cash flow in five years. Also, we can do it out of the appreciation. Like I have two ways to pay you back. Uh, we can refinance or we can just write a check out of the cash flow of the property as long as we sideline all of this and are responsible for building. Don't go buy any Lamborghinis or you know whatever with the money. You just write you a check and away you go. Um, so on that particular deal, um, that was just structured in a way where it's like, okay, um, here's the buyout. If we fail, you take our equity. So we did 33, 33, 33, me, him, <laughs> us. But if we fail to do the buyout, he gets our equity signed over. So you can do if-then clauses. Um, technically not a guarantee, though. Uh, but yeah, that, that is exactly how you structure it. You go, hey, this is your compensation is going to be done at buyout. Now, if you have a high cash flow deal, one, it's preferable to use debt because 
less partners you have, we talked about eliminating variables. Uh, the only variable I think that is more dangerous than variable rate debt is having a whole bunch of partners. Because uh, people are weird, people's goals change. It's uh, anyone who's partnered here, and I've, I've talked to a few of you. Um, I don't think anyone who's had partners has not been burned at least once by something. And sometimes it's not anyone's fault. Sometimes people go different directions. Sometimes it is just malicious. But uh, people are really hard. So if you have a lot of cash flow, I prefer debt. However, um, if a second, like say you can't put second position debt against the building, there's a no further encumbrance. You bring on a partner and you guys can share cash flow. If you're sharing cash flow or they have a, a fixed return out of the cash flow, their buyout's going to be smaller. If all the compensation of their buyout, that's kind of my general go-to. It's about two to one in five years. You put in a hundred thousand, you get out two. Most people are comfortable around there. If you go a hundred percent on debt, you're usually closer to 10 or 12%. I know some people borrow less, some people borrow more. Uh, we've borrowed everywhere uh, from six to 18% on deals like that. They just have to follow principles of long-term cash flow and debt. Uh, but the way you structure it, larger buyout, if there's less cash flow share on a higher cash flow deal, the buyout's usually smaller. And you just kind of keep those two things in balance. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my other question was about the interior and exterior. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't thought of that. That makes total sense about doing interiors first as far as if like your metric or whatever is, is like what the bank thinks of it. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Giving you that rent first. Like how do you balance that with marketability, which like the better your photos are, the easier it is to get people interested in the property. And, like, uh, yeah, they're not going to be leasing the whole property. But, yep. but it looks more, it looks better um, when they're walking up and they're parking here. Yeah, so the photos are really important. And, and, and of course, it's a lot easier to lease a property that looks nice on the outside. Like people, like we've had buildings where it's like they're in the middle of a project. And so like people walk up and they're just like, nah, I don't think I want to live here. And it's, do or doesn't happen. And they're like, nothing's better than a finished building, right? Like if your interiors and exteriors are done, that is amazing. As far as the marketing of units go, the main thing that I'm looking at as a buyer, or sorry, not as, a, as a renter, I'm like, w- what am I living in? Like, I see the exterior photo and it's a great cover, and I'm like, oh, that looks like a cool building. And then I'm skipping right into like, what is the space look like? How many beds? How many baths? That interior space and getting that marketed online is ultimately where people are going to live. And it's pretty easy to be able to tell a story on a lot of these properties. of like, okay, here's this property was purchased by new owners recently. Um, they're fixing up all the interiors right now. They actually just did a huge renovation project. Exteriors next, so you're getting in right now, and the project's getting a lot better. Uh, one of the biggest things that we actually do is right when we buy a property, first thing we do is we go to every single existing tenant. We go, hey, uh, what needs to be fixed? And all of those things like appliances, and like I have, I've had a broken toilet seat for three years. I had someone who didn't have a toilet seat for three years, and no one did anything about it. Like, I'm like, those are like $4. Um, someone could have done that. Uh, but like, you have people who have legitimate needs in their units. We go in, and it's not about being flashy, but I do like the community to see immediately. The building trades, there's always a little bit of like, ooh, what's going to happen? Am I gonna, is my rent going up? What's happening? First thing I want them to see before anything happens is the truck coming in with appliances being dropped off. And as soon as they see that, all of a sudden you get a whole bunch more work orders. They're like, Oh, I didn't mention anything. I didn't think you'd actually fix it. I actually do have this problem. And you just fix the, a lot of them are not that expensive. You do a few appliances, you fix a few toilets. You did so, Oh, I did. yeah, my sink's also been leaking for three years. Like you fix the easy things to fix. You do it immediately. Word usually gets out of the community. Like, Hey, there's new owners here. It's getting better. They're going to be doing projects. And then we start renovating units. They look nicer. People move in and then you upgrade the community around that. But I've, I've always liked that bottom up approach of like, let's get the livable spaces livable because you can't get income. If your whole building is just gorgeous and there's no flooring in a unit, right? Or there's a, like someone's going to come in and they're like, uh, there's rust all over everything or there's cockroaches. It's like, you can't rent a not rentable space. Yeah. Well, there's a couple guys in town who can, but they're, uh, their village getting contempt. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't rent a non livable space, create the livable spaces first. It's the easiest way to get the income up. And then you do want to do the exterior projects. Uh, to the developer's points, 
you want to do those exterior projects prior to refinance because those will make a those will make a significant impact on how much money you can value that. But do that out of the income first. That's why your debt needs to be long enough so you can do both sides. Any value in buying in bulk if you have a bigger unit or a bigger facility? Like yes. hundred unit, do you do that? Yes, uh, especially for things like flooring. We keep so much of that on backstock. We always overbuy flooring, uh, especially if it goes on sale. It's just, a, I like doing the same thing everywhere. Uh, I actually have a renovation policy. Uh, Danny and I, my wife, are going to speak about this a little bit more later. But uh, one of the main things that you do in buildings is you go, okay, uh, how do we have every building feel like us? It has, uh, I can use this flooring here, I can use it here, I can use it here. It looks nice everywhere. And it's still going to be nicer than the buildings directly around us. Your, your target is always, I want a nice, people over improve buildings, which Cody and I did like really bad on the 38. We spent like $10,000 a unit more than we should have. And that's my wife saying higher. Yeah, we spent like $20,000 a unit more than we should have uh, because we wanted to make it as good as possible because everyone wants to just optimize immediately. And what we found is that it didn't really raise rents all that much because people are only willing to pay so much to live in that area, just period. And so what you really want to target is how do you get a space that's better than the other properties in its class that could be, we have new windows and no other building does. Um, they all have lame carpet and we have a nicer floor. I mean, it's going to be something simple, but we have a little nicer space at like $50 a month less than the spaces around us. And if people pay a little less and get a little bit more, your vacancy is like dead. No one will move unless they're going to a whole new neighborhood, but you won't lose people to any of your competitors. That's what we try to renovate to. And so when we're doing any of these, those are like the, the big pieces. Is let's, let's just get this thing optimized, let's get it in there. And if you can buy a bulk, you save a lot. And so um, when we find flooring we like, it's like, let's just buy all of it. Cody and I in two weeks are gonna be in Moses Lake and our hotel, uh, our contractors are slammed right now. So we're going to lay the flooring like 15 units over a week. We just buy a truckload of that stuff. And then we're just going to be in there just doing glue down LVP. And then quite honestly, they're super easy to do. It's an easy project. And uh, yeah, we'll probably have that on YouTube. Cody and Christian, laying floors. Yeah, so the question on the refi side. Yeah. Um, you know, we went to some community banks, local banks, I've met with them, you know, call fees and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I know you have the, like, you, you there's, there's inspections and appraisals and all that. So how do you, you know, when you're kind of shopping around, like, which bank to work with, like, how do you really navigate that? Do you kind of just take a chance on one you like the most? Or cause, you know, how do you, you know what I mean? Like, how do you shop around, uh, like to get the best interest rate and terms and all that, you know? Yeah. The nice thing with banks is for the most part, they're all, they all have fairly similar products. Like a lot of them, not all, some of them hold on to their portfolios of loans, but a lot of them repackage them, sell them to Panic Freddy. They have, they have very similar products. Uh, the banks you want to work with in general are uh, actually exactly like you said, those local and regional banks. A lot of them have in their charter that they have to place X amount of money into multifamily in a given area. And so those are really who we want to work with. The easiest way to find them, and this is kind of like our answer for everything, uh, find out who in your market is absolutely just winning in real estate and whoever they're banking with is probably the best person to bank with, more often than not. And so there's two or three regional banks in Grant County and uh, we do some business with all of them. What we found, surprisingly, is that the biggest players in the town who buy a lot of the same asset class that we do, uh, they use the same mortgage broker. And so even with him, the group that lends on almost our entire portfolio in Moses Lake is a bank out of Texas. Like, they're like, oh yeah, central Washington and small towns. They're like, we love that. We want that. They, for whatever reason, he has a bank that wants exposure to that. And they absolutely love working with us. The only way we ever would have ran into that bank is because the guy who lines up the loans for all the other buildings, uh, that mortgage broker was the contact to go in and say, he's like, oh yeah, no, I, I some people want to place capital here. Uh, they're going to be out in Texas. I never would have guessed. So if you're doing the work yourself, local, regional, those are the people because they're charter. Um, if you're looking for like 
path of least resistance, where is everyone else getting their money from? It probably they probably still wanted to play capital in the same area. Like, yep. I can add to that a little bit. Yeah. So um, when you're going to do one of these refinances or any bank loan, you're going to put together a package for that bank, which is has like your purchase agreement, your renovation expenses all itemized, um, your rent roll, like every, all the documents they could possibly have. And so what you can do is you can put that together first because you know that the bank is going to require that. And then you can send, as you're having these conversations with all those banks that you're talking to, you can send them your package. And that way they can evaluate it. And at some point, if they're interested, they'll send you a term sheet or it could be a soft quote. None of that really means anything. Like those are the terms that you're going to end up getting. But what that does mean is that you can compare at that point how these terms look against each other and you, you can also you know have conversation with them to understand like what's their underwriting process and what's their review process and kind of get a feel for them qualitatively as well and so like that would be just another way of like kind of advancing that review process for you um to know what is likely going to be the best option yeah, cause to, just to see kind of their different fees and whatnot, it might be different from other banks. Yes. Because it's hard to, like, once you're kind of committed with appraisals and all that, it's like, you can't really, it's hard to shop it around, like, you know. It's, well, so, like, about the appraisal, the every lender is going to require um, you to use their appraiser, basically, yeah, exactly. right? And so you, you can get your own appraisal uh, beforehand, but they're not going to use it. Yeah, yeah. And so... Like the way I do it, at least, is like shop around, get those quotes in, go with the one that seems to be best, and then um, you know if those, if that doesn't work out, then you still have a few others that you talk to that could be good options too. Cool, like soft quotes. Cool. Right. Yeah, thank you. Oh. I I've found that it's usually the the banks that have the best terms are going to be those local and regional banks, almost. Almost every time they're going to be a little better because they, they need to be more competitive. It's hard to compete with a huge bank that has large books. So I always go there first and work my way out. Are you guys loading up deposits? What's that? Are you guys loading up deposits? Loading up deposits. Yeah. So like when we've been going to banks, what we do is because we, like you're saying, like, you know, raise the renovation budget too in your capital. Oh yeah. And so if you're willing to park a whole bunch of deposits with the oh, bank, yeah, yeah, yeah. they'll uh, drive your rate down like crazy. We'll do. Because everyone's hurting for deposits right now because that's how they loan their money. Gotcha. Yeah. That is that is one of the big strategies that uh yeah, that's one of the big strategies that we do is that we go through uh the banks that we want the loans for, especially those regional ones, early on, open an account and I move some of my bigger LLCs. To that bank, mm -hmm. you can even like holding money there is great, but they really like to see how much money you're actually just running through the account. Yeah. So if you come in and you're just like, yeah, um, I just have a lot of velocity. We have a lot of different properties. Uh, we'll keep moving stuff over. Um, they really value longevity, so I mean, you want to do that early in a market. But that is what we did. Is we went to the owners who were like, hey, who are you making with, and what terms are they giving you? And we moved a lot of money. Right into those counts. Yeah, <clears throat> we've done that for SBA funds too. Same, same thing on, on the business side. And we just come in and we're like, hey, uh, you know, I have twenty seven LLCs with you guys. Each of them do pretty well. We run a lot of money through the accounts. Um, there was one loan where they said, uh, we just we're not really doing that right now. We don't want to give it to you. I was like, okay, I will just go ahead and take my business elsewhere. And they emailed back and they're like. Well, we can actually give you about half of that. We can do that today. We just prove it. I was like, well, half of it is actually what I need. So yeah, let's do it. So yeah, they're, they're, banks do appreciate it when you run money through them. Could you guess at what a percentage rate you get difference between what are you parking your funds there? Like, you yeah, they'll tell you. Oh, okay. And so then you can say, like that's not good point. enough. They tell me you're going to move it somewhere else. <laughs> but I mean, it's like a feel for it. like if I had yeah, a couple so. hundred thousand, I parked it there for a while. Or I ran money. Would I get a quarter rate? Decrease or half or what kind of rate you looking at? Uh, I don't even. Banks banks pay so low right now. I don't. I don't even look at the deposit rate. I'm just looking yeah. at the velocity of how much we can move. If oh, I don't mean on the, the income on the deposits. I'm talking about. The oh, on all the all the rate for the loan. Yeah. 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 If you if we've been doing like if you do if you were willing to put like ten percent in the bank, the ten percent of the value of the loan in the bank, they'll knock like a quarter point. Okay. 
That's, that's, that's that sounds like that, that's about right. Banks appreciate that you have reserves with them. Mm-hmm. It's usually not astronomical though. I, the, the biggest thing for me is the is always the velocity of the ability to do deals, and so it's the ease of getting through underwriting, and that is really the other thing that I love with working with the same bank again and again is that they already have a lot of your docs. They already the, the relationship actually does matter a lot. I, I value that more than the quarter point or half yeah, point that you say yeah. for sure. Because uh, I'm going after deals, I'm like, okay, we're going to make, you know, 25% of this, we're going to double our money in this. If we're doing a hotel conversion right now, we're buying for a million six. I think it's going to raise out at about three million. Uh, so we have a ton of upside there. I'm like, I just want to make to place the loan. And then we're going to get the value up, we're probably going to refinance it anyway. So I'm like, let's just get the loan done. Um, a lot of the deals we do, the quarter point doesn't make the difference, but the bank having a history with you and having access to your numbers makes your underwriting of submissions way easier. And that is the biggest value, at least for me, in working consistently with the same things.